Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Stephen Flanagan, the Henry Kissinger Chair in National Security and Diplomacy here at the Center for Strategic and International Studies. And it's a pleasure to welcome a number of, of good uh, friends and, and former colleagues uh, and, and those in many good quality people interested in, in Taiwan and, and uh, security relations in East Asia. We're also delighted to have as our speaker today uh, a, a good friend of CSIS and many of us in the room, uh, uh, Mr. Andrew Nenzu Yang. Uh, who is, of course, the Vice Minister for Policy at the Ministry of Defense in Taiwan, a position that he has held uh, since uh, just celebrating his second anniversary, a little over his second anniversary in that job since September of 2009. Uh, Vice Minister Yang, as many of you know, has uh, been an influential scholar and advisor to policymakers on defense strategy, on cross-strait and regional security issues. He's uh, perhaps best known uh, in this audience uh, for his, his work as Secretary General of the Chinese Council of Advanced Policy Study, CAPS, for nearly two decades. Uh, he's, of course, also held a number of faculty appointments and at the Sun Yat-sen University, uh, where he also worked as a research uh, associate earlier in his career. He has, of course, been an influential advisor to policymakers in the Ministry of National Defense, the Mainland Affairs Council and the Ministry of Foreign Affairs over these many years, and, and as I said, a good friend uh, to many people in this room. His education earlier was at, at Fujian University in sociology, quite diverse, then going into uh, a master's degree in industrial sociology, and then a master's degree also uh, in economics at the London School of Economics. And he was also a uh, research associate in political economy at Wolfson College at Oxford University. Uh, Vice Minister Yang is going to talk about the security situation in the Asia-Pacific uh, region uh, and on uh, elements of Taiwan's defense strategy and defense transformation efforts. Uh, this address is on the record. Uh, we will, uh, he will speak for about uh, 30 minutes, uh, and then we will uh, turn the floor over uh, to discussion, uh, which will be moderated uh, by my colleague uh, Bonnie Glazer, a senior fellow uh, with the Freeman Chair. Uh, here at CSIS. So without further ado, let me welcome to the floor uh, Admiral, I mean, uh, <laughs> Vice Minister. I'm sorry, we also have a, an Admiral in the audience, uh, Vice Minister Andrew Young. <laughs> Thank you, Stephen, for your such a gracious introduction. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and my good friends I'm here. Um, this is my fifth uh, visit to uh, CSIS out of my 11th uh, visit to Washington, D.C. for the last two years. Uh, when I joined uh, the MND as Vice Defense Minister, it's a, it's a very, very uh, uh, precious experience for me and I also personally witnessed a very strong ties uh, between United States and Republic of China on Taiwan. My visits also symbolize we have a very robust, very productive, and very uh, strong relations for the last couple of years. I want to address some of the issues which are personally involved and uh, give you some of the perspectives about what should be uh, uh, done in terms of uh, continue to consolidate and to strengthen the ties between the U.S. and Taiwan. I think in terms of uh, uh, the strong and robust relations that we have experienced for the last couple of years, which symbolize uh, this close and strong relations was based on a share uh, the same values of upholding democracy and freedom, uh, not only in Taiwan, but also in terms of uh, U.S. conduct of its foreign policies. Secondly, uh, it is also a symbol of U.S. strong commitment to Taiwanese security codified by the Taiwan Relations Act and continuously supporting Taiwan to strengthen its self-defense. It is also symbolizing we have a received strong uh, executive branch and bipartisan congressional support over Taiwanese uh, defense needs in the past couple of years. We also uh, 
continuously conduct very uh, productive, robust interactions at the policy level, at the working level, and at the service level throughout the years. In all those kind of uh, uh, very uh, uh, close and uh, strong ties, we have achieved, I think, uh, uh, at least for several things. Number one, enhancing uh, mutual trust uh, between uh, M&D and Pentagon. Uh, in terms of uh, looking at uh, and identify some of the needed uh, uh, areas for uh, strengthening our defense in the past. It also uh, uh, identify the areas of cooperations and continuous cooperations down the road as well. It is also a symbol of uh, abundant mutual trust between both sides, and also a symbol of a strong support for uh, our course of uh, national policies in terms of conducting uh, peaceful cross-strait interactions, uh, assisting Taiwanese participation in many international activities, and also uh, helping Taiwan to conduct its necessary defense transformations so that we can continue to strengthen our self-defense. So it is not only about arms sales in, term, uh, in terms of U.S. Taiwanese uh, defense ties. It is a very much a comprehensive mutual relations covering not only uh, national security issues, but also uh, issues involving regional peace and stability as well. If we look at uh, the situation in the Western Pacific Ocean areas, we're still facing a number of uh, challenges down the road, not only in terms of the traditional security challenges. Uh, in the, those uh, disputes in the Korean Peninsula, uh, in terms of uh, uh, Chinese uh, continuous uh, military modernization and its power projection. But also, we also witness that uh, there is a uh, uh, dynamic uh, and uh, potentially uh, complex situation in the South China Sea and also in the East China Sea as well. So there are elements of uncertainties in terms of uh, security challenges in the future. However, I think that the we can also uh, continuously conduct uh, robust interactions and exchanges to share our perceptions and assessments over the uh, regional security issues and to address areas of uh, mutual interest and continuous uh, cooperation in order to continue to preserve peace and stability in those regions. In addition to that, uh, we also enter into the discussions how to address the challenges uh, uh, emerging uh, in terms of unconventional security uh, issues, uh, such as uh, climate change and uh, humanitarian and disaster re relief, which are badly needed uh, for not only uh, countries in the region, but also for Taiwan as well. We also uh, have to address uh, the issue of uh, uh, preventing uh, weapons of mass destruction proliferation. We certainly have uh, uh, put in a lot of effort to address those uh, mutual cooperation in this WMD proliferation issue here. We also continue to share information uh, in terms of preventing piracy at sea. This is also another area for our concern as well. Uh, in terms of addressing uh, uh, unconventional security challenges, in the past we al already uh, sh show some uh, benefits and effects 
in terms of addressing the humanitarian and disaster relief operations, such as uh, uh, our efforts to, to conduct relief operations and disaster relief operations to assist Haitian earthquakes, uh, aftermath rescue operations. Uh, this is the example of close cooperation between the United States and our Air Force in terms of assisting this long-range voyage to provide necessary helps to Haitian earthquakes, disaster relief operations. We also witness there is a cooperation in terms of uh, addressing the needs and helps as a result of uh, Typhoon Monaco taking place in Taiwan, and U.S. Marine and uh, Navy providing necessary humanitarian assistance to assist our uh, aftermath uh, uh, damage control in Taiwan as well. These are the two examples to show that there are areas for our uh, cooperation in the future so that uh, we can work together to prevent and address needs to prevent the unconventional security challenges as well. In the meantime, we also uh, have very uh, uh, proactive interactions in terms of addressing our future defense transformation needs. The emphasis is how to assist Taiwan to acquire astrometrical capabilities and advanced technologies so that we can continue to strengthen our self-defense to support our peaceful approach to mainland China. I think uh, the congressional hearings conducted uh, in September, late September, and both uh, Peter Lavoy, Assistant Secretary for Defense, and also Dr. Kirk Campbell, Assistant Secretary of State, uh, attended the hearing and gave a very, very uh, comprehensive and detailed uh, remarks to address why Taiwan is uh, important and why Taiwan is still in need of uh, U.S. defense support. The message are on the wall, abundantly clear, that United States support for Taiwan is to enhance our self-confidence to conduct necessary uh, policies to strengthen uh, the peace and stability environment in this area. I think it shows that United States and Taiwan share the same values, share the same concerns, and share the same interest, not only to preserve peace and stability, but also to help countries in the neighborhood to conduct their identical and parallel peace and uh, freedom and democracy in order to upgrading their nation in a more stable uh, road down the road. So in that case, I think uh, U.S. Taiwan security cooperation is vitally important, a very strong pillar to support the entire Asian Pacific region's future peace and stability, and also continue to conduct economic uh, modernization so that uh, we can also share the accomplishments as a result of uh, this effort. Recently, Secretary Clinton repeatedly addressed that U.S. will continue to commit its support for Asia and also continue to uh, uh, show U.S. Uh, strength to support Asia's development as well. I think this message is well received at home. We will continue to go close ties with the United States and work closely with U.S. government and also Pentagon in terms of not only to continue to strengthen our self-defense, but also to share 
common objectives and views to address the security needs in this region. As for Taiwan, there are some uh, areas for our concerns in our future continuous efforts to strengthen our self-defense. The number one concern is we want to get as much resources and support for our efforts at home. Uh, in terms of uh, defense modernization and uh, transformation, uh, it is necessary to provide sufficient resources support for this effort. This will be the task not only for, not only for MND uh, to uh, convince the legislators but in, and cabinet to give us necessary support. We also want to alert the public that security should be the priority for our concern in the course of developing peace and stability in the region. Secondly, we have to pay attention to the demographic changes and the, uh, the shortage of manpower in our society as well, because that also related to the implementation of our volunteer systems in the future. So in terms of uh, upgrading the quality of our personnel and manpower, and in terms of uh, getting the right people to uh, cope with the necessary defense tr transformation in Taiwan, is also very vital for our policy and policy imp implementation in the future. Last but not least, we have to pay great attention and all the uh, complex issues in terms of how to achieve our asymmetrical capability in the future. This will be the area for continuous discussions between my department and Pentagon in the future. I think we have to address the needs, how to enhance the quality of our defense not only the quantity issue. We appreciate that the United States uh, Defense Department has produced its air defense uh, review report uh, and submitted to the Congress in September. In fact, this report is very much based on a continuous uh, discussion between Pentagon and MND in the last couple of years. We have uh, actually uh, examined the uh, areas uh, for our air defense requirements in the future. And we will continue to discuss some of the priorities so that the air defense issue can be uh, met in our discussion and acquisition in the future. What I want to say in my last few a couple of minutes is that my own personal experience it has shown we maintain strong ties between the ROC, MND, and Pentagon in the last, last couple of years. This is the result not only uh, a fact of uh, mutual trust, but also surprise-free. Uh, we continue to conduct this uh, robust and trustworthy interactions, both at a policy level and at a uh, working level, and continue to address the issue so that we will fulfill our objectives and with the U.S. assistance and commitments for our security and defense. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Vice Minister Young. Always a pleasure to have you back here at uh, CSIS. We will now take uh, questions uh, from the floor, and uh, please wait for the microphone and uh, identify yourself before asking uh, your question.
Thank you. I'm uh, Tom Reckford with the World Affairs Council. Uh, Vice Minister, you referred uh, slightly uh, to issues in the South China Sea. We've heard a lot lately about claims from Beijing uh, for the, the Spratly Islands. We know that Taiwan has similar claims but hasn't been talking so much about them. What is Taiwan's position uh, on the South China Sea? Perhaps I could add to that question a little bit. There has been some uh, discussion in the press uh, about the possibility of uh, Taiwan reinforcing its uh, weapons uh, on uh, Taiping Island, which it occupies, uh, it belongs to the uh, to the claimed by the Republic of China as well as claimed uh, by some other countries. And uh, last year, or earlier this year, I think there were reports about the possibility of replacing the uh, Coast Guard forces that, the, the, that is deploy deployed there with uh, Marines. And uh, I know there have been some denials uh, issued from your defense ministry, but perhaps you can clarify that as well. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the question, and thanks for Bonnie's uh, for the elaboration of the situation. Uh, first of all, uh, our policy in terms of uh, the area of South China Sea is very much uh, holding the position that we are protecting our sovereignty in this area, and we continue to uh, address issues of uh, uh, cooperation and uh, setting aside the disputes in emphasizing areas of mutual interest and uh, seeking cooperation to resolve the problems in the sprightly uh, disputes. And we also urging the regional multilateral uh, mechanisms uh, inviting Taiwan uh, to be part of the process so that we can achieve a peaceful code of conduct to manage the sea lanes of communication in this area. So our policy remain intact and still very much uh, seeking cooperation and uh, setting aside the disputes. With regard to the troop stations in the Sprati Islands, we haven't changed our position uh, since the, uh, uh, the beginning of this administration. That is, we continue to support the uh, current Coast Guard stations at the Sprati Islands so that uh, they will regulate the area to conduct uh, judicial uh, uh, operations in defending the territory as well. Um, we have no plan to replace the Coast Guards by the uh, armed forces. Um, we have no plan to uh, reinforce the island security and defense by introduction of uh, further uh, high-tech weapon systems or troops stationed on the island. We still maintain the policy. We will support the Coast Guards and uh, improving their abilities so that they can conduct their uh, defense on the island and also regulating the sea areas surrounding the island. Richard Bush. Um, you mentioned the uh, creation of a volunteer force, and you mentioned a couple of external challenges, uh, manpower and budget. Uh, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about uh, the challenges that you've identified internally uh, when you make a transition from a conscript force to a um, volunteer force, and what are the lessons you're learning? Thank you. Thank you, Richard, for the question. Uh, with regard to the internal challenges that we are facing uh, in terms of uh, replacing, or not replacing, uh, uh, reinforcing the volunteer forces instead of uh, uh, emphasizing the conscription uh, 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 that we have uh, in, in the current day, 
Uh, there are three areas, internal uh, challenges. Number one, uh, legislative support for necessary amendment of the uh, military laws and regulations, organization laws and regulations, uh, to uh, assist the implementation of uh, this transformation. Uh, not only the uh, imp uh, increasing the volunteers for our armed forces, but also to address the need for further defense uh, restructuring, organizational changes as well. So these two or three pieces of legislation are vitally important for the success of uh, assisting the volu volunteer systems to be uh, enacted uh, in, the, in, in the near future. That's number one. Number two, uh, we need to convince the cabinet and also the OI to give us, uh, to, provide, to provide us with sufficient resources, uh, adequate uh, increase in our budget to pay for the necessary cost for the introduction of the volunteer system in the future. Number three is the public support uh, for the volunteer system. So that requires a lot of uh, education, not only, not only from the M&D's point of view, but also in terms of uh, the overall support from the uh, grassroots. Uh, we need to enhance the educational systems to educate our youngsters what are the areas uh, of uh, necessities and importance so that uh, the volunteer systems can actually helping us to conduct necessary transformation in the future. So those are the three major internal challenges that I can identify so far. John San with CTI TV. Hi, Minister Yan. Good to see you again here in DC. Um, during your visit uh, this time, have you uh, heard any uh, clarification from the uh, the Pentagon about uh, um, Secretary uh, Panetta's uh, remarks that uh, the U.S. gave Beijing heads up before the uh, arms sales announcement? And uh, and and uh, have you heard any um, any new uh, movement? on Taiwan's continuing request for the uh, F-16 CDs. And also, you spoke of the uh, asymmetric uh, capabilities. Uh, in what particular or specific areas would you like the United States to uh, help Taiwan uh, develop? Thank you very much. Thank you, John. Um, As far as I know, uh, we haven't got uh, a public uh, announcements or statements regarding the issue you mentioned, the heads up issues that Secretary Panada um, made the remarks during his visit to Asia. But uh, we actually uh, receive private explanations of what's the situation in the course of uh, conducting those remarks and fully understand uh, the remarks made in his talk was not related to anything the U.S. commitment to Taiwanese defense. So it's abundantly clear uh, there's no direct relations between uh, those remarks and U.S. commitment for our defense, that's number one. Number two, with regard to the F-16 CD issue you mentioned, I think um, Assistant Secretary of State and, uh, and uh, Assistant Secretary of Defense, they made uh, those uh, uh, remarks at the congressional hearings already emphasizing this will be the issue uh, under consideration by the U.S. government in the future as well. We will continue to discuss the issue with the U.S. side uh, to see what should be done 
in terms of uh, handling the issue. So we have no further reports so far uh, regarding the, the F-16 you mentioned. Asymmetric capability, this is a priority and vitally important <coughs> for our continuous defense modernization and transformation. Uh, we take this issue very seriously and we continue to discuss with the U.S. side, uh, with Pentagon, uh, what should be done and what are the priorities uh, in terms of uh, enhancing our asymmetrical capabilities. Uh, capabilities. Uh, they are, uh, we keep an open mind, and uh, there are uh, many areas and opportunities to address the, uh, the issue in the future. Alan Romberg. Thank you. Alan Romberg, Stimson Center. Andrew Hi, Alan. Good to see you. Taking advantage of John's precedent of asking two questions, I'm going to do that. Okay. Uh, one is to follow up on Tom Reckford's question about the South China Sea. The PRC is very unclear, shall we say, about the significance of the nine-dashed line. But since it's a line that was drawn uh, when the ROC was sitting uh, on the mainland, I wonder if you could give us some help in understanding Taipei's understanding of what it means. Does it mean sovereignty over all the waters, over the land features? Uh, what about uh, the possibility of territorial waters or EEZs? Do you have something you can help us understand Taipei's perspective since the claim is for the same uh, set of uh, islands, reefs, and so on as Beijing claims, and yet their claim about the line itself is not very clear. The second is, while I would uh, welcome having you address uh, political issues, my sense is you'll want to stay away from them like the plague, but, I, but the issue of uh, a peace accord is on the table uh, since President Ma raised it uh, on October 17th. My question is, from an MND perspective, uh, although obviously this is an issue for the future, and not something that anybody has sort of figured out what should be and what shouldn't be and so on and so forth. But have you thought about conceptually what you would be concerned to be included in any peace accord and what you would be concerned should be excluded? Again, from an M&D uh, perspective. The first question is much easier than the second one. Yes. <laughs> Comparatively speaking, yes. Well, in fact, you mentioned PRC uh, is unclear about its nine dash claim. In reality, we call it a historical waters uh, in our uh, perspective. Uh, so PRC just succeeded, they took over our claims as their claims, so they don't have a position for it because so long as it's a historical water, as far as the ROC is concerned. And for Beijing, I mean P, uh, PRC government, they consider they are the only legitimate government representing entire China. So they spontaneously, uh, you know, without uh, uh, asking our consent or whatever, yeah. <laughs> take over the claim by themselves. That's my understanding. Uh, so we call it our historical water. We don't have a, you know, a clear definition abiding by the International Code of Conduct, but it, it's as a result of uh, 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 post-World War II uh, uh, events, you know, accumulated, uh, you know, afterwards that we have explored the area and we considered uh, this is our historical water. So PRC simply follow or to take over this claim by themselves. Um, so if they are not clear, that's their business. It's not our business. 
so we still consider that uh, uh, so long as this historical issue here cannot be resolved, and we set aside those disputes and the seeking cooperations and uh, uh, and uh, and uh, peaceful resolutions for this area. So we are not enforcing. Uh, as far as our policy is concerned, we are not enforcing uh, these historical claims. We only address this is the historical issue. But we, we have one typing island which is under our control and our sovereignty in the Sprotty area. So we certainly have to do something about it. Uh, this is our position right now. I mentioned the second question will be very difficult. It's hypothetical. Eric, you never asked hypothetical question in the past, but uh, <laughs> but I would not speak for the MND's position. Uh, it's my own uh, personal position here. I think one thing should be included if should there be a peace accord in the future. There's no time timetable for it. I think Beijing has, must make, the, make it abundantly clear uh, that they will not refer the use of force against Taiwan. Abandoning the use of force, not only against Taiwan, abandoning the use of force in their uh, foreign policies, for example, or at least abandoning the use of force against Taiwan. I think that's, that's the, uh, the must. Uh, without those terms, how can you secure there's a peace based on this peace accord? And they have to honor it. Uh, renouncing the use of force is vital uh, for Beijing's approach. Short of that, my personal opinion is that you cannot guarantee there's a peace, uh, even you sign an agreement with, with Beijing. Don't quote it as about government policy. It's my own personal opinion. Yeah, yeah. Well, maybe I can build on that and ask you um, your personal opinion. <laughs> on a topic that we have uh, talked about a great deal, uh, which is uh, cross-strait confidence building measures in the military sphere, and what the prerequisite uh, for CBMs uh, would be. And I know that your ministry has done a great deal of research uh, on military confidence building measures, and even in the absence of uh, it, a formal agreement um, there are some uh, search and rescue type activities that are underway, not between militaries, but between uh, the uh, local uh, law enforcement uh, agencies. Uh, my view is, as you well know, that there is, uh, there could be significant benefits to both sides in pursuing military CBMs, particularly increasing the predictability of the security environment and creating uh, communication mechanisms between the two sides that could be useful um, potentially in a crisis to de-escalate um, and manage uh, a situation. So my question is whether you think that there is some kind of an organic relationship between a peace accord and beginning a discussion and on military CBMs? Is there one that is required before the other? Do they go in parallel? Um, do you have any sense as to what you think in your personal view would make sense in terms of the sequencing? And my assumption, of course, is no timetable, so we're not talking about today or tomorrow or any time soon. Thank you, Bonnie, for the question. Uh, I think uh, over the time, uh, gradually, uh, within uh, my government, there is a uh, process of uh, consensus building right now. 
that the situation between two sides of the Taiwan Strait is quite unique. Uh, it's difficult to adopt the uh, experiences in other regions or other countries regarding building CBMs to be applied or to be imposed in the situation of the Taiwan Strait area as a result of uh, very complex historical uh, issues uh, on both sides. So I think the consensus uh, building in recent uh, months and, and over the year or so is that we should achieve uh, political trust. I mean, CBM is predicated on abundant and sufficient political mutual trust between two sides. That's the kind of a notion and perception we have developed in our domestic, uh, at least at a policy level. Um, short of abundant and sufficient political trust, uh, it's, it would be difficult to, 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 to put forward military-to-military uh, -military confidence building measures. Uh, so I think that uh, President Ma also made it uh, bound and clear that uh, to, to pursue economic and easy parts in the first place and uh, institutionalizing uh, mutual agreements signed uh, over the years regarding economic and investments uh, between two sides. And that symbolized this accumulated uh, process to enhance mutual trust. So it's not in, in reverse that uh, we should uh, go for a mil mil uh, CBA in the first place and seeking uh, peaceful coal uh, in the future. Uh, so I think that probably will be uh, the, uh, the general uh, consensus in Taiwan right now. That doesn't necessarily to say that we're not seeking in a possible CBM. There's one area I think that it, uh, certainly uh, was uh, considering. That is, can either side to make efforts to uh, think about how to make a unilateral declaration over certain issues. For example, the issues I mentioned that the, if Beijing considered uh, continuous uh, peaceful engagement with Taiwan is beneficial to Beijing's interests, and they already achieve uh, uh, abundant confidence in conducting peaceful engagement with Taipei, can Beijing, you know, simply renounce the use force? Can they simply say that we are in a very uh, solid, peaceful position right now, and we cherish this uh, accomplishment made by both sides in the past, and we want to continue to go for it. So the element to use force certainly will be a strong and big obstacle to handicap uh, the process. So will be Beijing willing to renounce the use of force or to consider to renounce the use of force, for example. So either side can do unilateral declaration in order to enhance uh, mutual trust so that uh, we can achieve more uh, peaceful elements to assist this process to resolve the uh, difficult political issues in the future. So that. That's the kind of thing I'm thinking about. Great. Still my personal opinion. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Minister, for your Wait for your mic, please. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Minister, um, a uh, draft report of the U.S.-China Economic Security and Review Commission uh, has found that um, the contracting for and delivery of 
some of the arms that uh, Taiwan was uh, seeking and that have been notified to Congress has been very slow. It said that four of 60 Black Hawk helicopters notified in January 2010 only had been placed on order. And I think uh, only 9% of Apache helicopters notified in October 2008 um, had been placed on order. Uh, similarly, uh, it raised the uh, possibility that um, no orders or few orders had been placed for uh, Patriot Pac-3 fire control units notified in January 2010. Uh, I wonder if, in line with your remark that uh, you have to discuss the needs of quality, not only quantity, Taiwan is, in fact, um, reducing its plan to purchase any or all of those systems and others uh, for funding reasons or others. Uh, can, you, um, can you clarify where that situation stands? Jim, um, you know better than I do that uh, U.S.-China uh, economic and security uh, commission is established by the Congress to look into the issues concerns U.S. economic and security interests and uh, making recommendations to the government, U.S. government, to uh, uh, adjust their policies or their policy implementation to protect the U.S. interests in that regard. So the question you, uh, you raised um, should be the concern from the Congress uh, towards the U.S. government, uh, not directly towards our government uh, as far as I can see. Uh, in fact, our relations conducted between M&D and Pentagon is very much based on the Taiwan Relations Act and uh, uh, the issues regarding arms sales and acquisitions are uh, very much based on the code of conduct uh, signed by U.S. government and Taiwan follow the foreign military sales arrangements. So far as I can see, uh, we haven't actually faced uh, the concerns or problems or delays or, uh, you know, sh shortages you mentioned by the draft report uh, uh, published or, or, you know, uh, deliberated by, by USCC uh, because we have no, received no direct uh, uh, information or responses from our contact point at the Pentagon. So as far as I can see that uh, things are going uh, in accordance with the plan, with the schedule, uh, even the issues uh, raised by the USCC was very much in control uh, by the uh, US uh, Defense Department and their uh, conduct with the US defense industries. Well, that's what I say in terms of addressing how to reinforce the asymmetrical capability in the future because there are uh, issues need to be addressed so that uh, we will enhance our defense capabilities based on the asymmetrical uh, 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 you know, perception. I, I, ju just to uh, drill down a bit, if I may, on that asymmetrical issue that you raised, uh, you cited the um, 
the report to Congress in September on air power issues, air defense issues. Um, and um, as we've uh, since learned, uh, the report uh, shows concern for whether uh, further investments in new F-16s makes good sense given the threat to Taiwan's runways in any crunch. Uh, and so one of the uh, asymmetric solutions might be uh, something like the F-35 short uh, takeoff and vertical landing uh, aircraft. I wonder whether uh, you're interested in exploring with the United States the possibility of acquiring the uh, Stovall version of the F-35, uh, perhaps either in addition to the F-16 or uh, as a substitute for the F-16, specifically because of the threat to Taiwan's runways. As I mentioned uh, earlier, our position is quite open. And we welcome any kind of uh, meaningful uh, discussions or suggestions in the process of uh, identifying uh, adequate and suitable and effective asymmetrical capability in the future. As I mentioned, as I mentioned, we are quite open and uh, waiting for interesting <laughs> introductions. Yes. Interesting suggestions. Other questions? Okay, Dr. Flanagan. Okay, Andrew, uh, I did have a question. If, if we could come back to uh, the, the uh, earlier question about uh, unconventional uh, threats to Taiwan's security and, and to global security, really, and, and that is the whole question of cyber defense. In fact, right. we had a, a, a very interesting conference here at CSIS on Monday on that question and looking more globally and also relations with our allies and partners on, uh, on cyber defense. Um, I wondered, uh, obviously, the, as you know, the debate here in the U.S. has been the, uh, partly around the whole question of who's in charge of cyber defense. Uh, should it be a military lead, a uh, uh, military and, and, and elements of, this, of the intelligence and security services? Um, and, uh, and how do we integrate uh, all of the elements, including engaging the private sector in, in effective cyber defenses? And I wondered if you could describe uh, how um, the, the Ministry of Defense has, in, in Taipei has looked at this, uh, how your plans have evolved in terms of thinking about this challenge, and, and what, is, what is the state of your coordination with other agencies of government and the private sector in, in, Taipei, in Taiwan more broadly uh, uh, about uh, plans to deal with uh, the potential disruption of, of critical communications and, and uh, command and control systems and, and critical infrastructure uh, through cyber means. Uh, thank you, Dr. Flanagan. Uh, indeed, this is the uh, vitally, uh, vital important issue as far as MND is concerned. Uh, in, I would describe our current uh, cyber defense situation in two parts. One, uh, we have uh, uh, isolated the military uh, information systems, um, you know, uh, which is different from the uh, non-military information system currently um, uh, in, in, in Taiwan. So we sort of, uh, uh, this is a very rudimentary way to prevent an, any intrusion into the uh, military information systems by simply isolating uh, from the civilian use. Uh, only in recent months, Actually, uh, a government has put in great emphasis on set up, setting up a national level of uh, uh, cyber and information security systems on, in, within the executive yuan. Uh, this is a coordination uh, commission uh, involving both military and non-military and other civilian departments. Uh, to look into the areas uh, should be strengthened in terms of protecting governments uh, and civilian 
um, uh, information uh, systems. That's one uh, system, I, I mean, the uh, newly created uh, uh, echelons under the executive yuan. <coughs> Uh, the other one is uh, created by the National Security Council. Uh, in that uh, cyber and information security uh, task force, uh, MND has uh, actively participated in, in assisting the National Security Council to set up uh, this uh, task group to, link, to look into the areas uh, needed to be uh, strengthened both uh, in the military uh, s uh, sector and non-military sectors. And then they will make recommendations to the president and also to the cabinet in terms of how to uh, combine uh, this uh, national security, uh, cyber security task force and the executive branch <laughs> commission to coordinate with each other and setting up the priorities for uh, the improvements of the security apparatus here. So it's still in the very beginning of uh, uh, putting uh, extra efforts and resources to consolidate uh, this issue. We haven't decided yet who is in charge, but uh, military take the lead uh, to protect our military information system in the first place. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, lesson learned, I mean, for other impl implications, they needed our assistance to provide the, the, our experiences to set up the cybersecurity for non-military use as well. So maybe in time, we will decide who is going to uh, uh, lead the, uh, the, this, uh, uh, this effort or not. So I cannot give you the definite answer right now. Mike Fonte. Dr. Young, good to see you. Uh, Mike Fonte, I'm the Washington liaison for the Democratic Progressive Party. You mentioned the, that the good relations between uh, Taiwan and the United States uh, during the Ma administration, based on no surprises, is one element of it. I think a lot of people in, in Washington, though, are have been surprised by the uh, defense budget numbers going down rather significantly uh, over the last two years. And I wonder if you could explain that a bit for us and how uh, you indicated that you had, a, from M MND's perspective, you had to convince both the LY and the executive branch to put money in the pot. And it seems a little strange with the KMT controlling both, both of those institutions that you're having so much trouble with defense budget. So I wonder if you would explain why the uh, defense budget has gone down to 2.2% or something like that of GDP. Thanks. Thank you, Mike. Uh, yes, this is uh, indeed the fact that the, uh, we haven't achieved uh, the promised 3% GDP of uh, national defense budget in the past couple of years. But if you look at the uh, actual uh, defense budget, which obviously has been affected by the government's uh, concern for their priority spendings, uh, which is abundantly clear. I don't have to explain why um, uh, the resources allocation, uh, uh, you know, decision making uh, adopted by, by the government. Um, of course, we continue to make efforts to address the importance of uh, adequate and sufficient uh, defense uh, resources allocation so that we can continue to conduct our defense transformation and implementing major defense policies in the future. Governments are aware of that. They consider there's a need uh, for uh, more resources allocation for defense. However, uh, due to the constraint of the national budget and uh, due to the priorities, uh, we cannot, cannot achieve our objectives uh, in the past two years. But if you look at the next year's budget, uh, we are making effort, even though there is a slight increase uh, for our national defense uh, budget, 
but it, this is a result of a very intensive effort made by the MND and convincing not only the cabinet but also AOI to give us money because we have a major task ahead, at hand. Uh, for example, implementing the volunteer system, for, uh, that's number one, and also uh, necessary acquisition uh, in down the road as well. So next year, uh, uh, if the budget can be approved by LY uh, before mid-December, uh, then we will have a more budget uh, for uh, 2012. That's a step forward. But if you look down in the future, I'm confident that uh, we will get more resources allocation given the fact we already uh, received the approval from the U.S. to provide F-16 AB retrofit. That certainly acquires sufficient money to put into it. And if LY can assist MND to implement the volunteer system, then we will get the more uh, budget for personnel cost in the future as well. So that, that will add up to the defense uh, spending uh, for the following years. So I'm sure there are more resources available uh, in terms of uh, our future defense budgets. Uh, so consensus building and continuous effort to convince the cabinet and the ROI that this is a priority for our country is important. Thank you. In the back row. Minister Yong, hey, my name is Adam Carrington. I'm a contractor with my name is Adam Carrington. I'm a contractor with DOD. Um, I was wondering if you could address some of the policy shifts that MND has undertaken because of the general low fallout. And also, has there been any type of concurrent interface with DOD because of the fallout we're experiencing from the WikiLeaks case? And maybe the two are interacting with one another to address the problems from insider threats. Thank you. As far as I can see, Adam, uh, those two cases has not direct uh, impact over our policies. Um, we're still very much putting efforts to continue our current and future efforts to meet our de defense tra transformation objectives. So, so far, there's no impact over our policy. Let me ask uh, another question. Several months ago, President Ma talked about the need to establish uh, some kind of a code of conduct that would guide uh, the interaction between retired military officers in Taiwan uh, and uh, their counterparts on the mainland uh, as a result of some uh, cases and the large growing number of retired military officers uh, that are visiting uh, the mainland. So I'm wondering if you could talk about what the progress has been in that regard and um, what such a code of conduct might, might look like. Um, and it's my understanding that it would not be legally binding. So how would it actually be implemented? Thank you. Thank you, Bonnie. In fact, there's no uh, written code of conduct or any verbal code of conduct to be addressed to this issue. The only thing I can see is that there are moral persuasions. Uh, there, there were uh, continuous uh, moral persuasions uh, conducted to convince those retired senior officers uh, to pay great attention to our national interests. Uh, we are not prohib prohibiting their visits to men in China, but uh, simply uh, aware, uh, alert those, uh, those uh, senior retired officers uh, in the course of conducting their visit, uh, always address the needs to protect our national interests. So I call it as a moral persuasion and it is taking effect as well. Thank you. Other questions? 
So you guys are very satisfied. Yes. <laughs> well, it seems like you have answered um, all of our questions and probably solved all of the problems that Taiwan faces as well. Uh, so we would like to very much uh, uh, thank you for uh, coming today and talking to us and hope that you'll come back soon. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, Thank you all.